just quickly, I've mentioned that me and Emily uh, are working on a project. It's called the Get the Marches Buzzing, and we're restoring over 60 habitat hectares of habitat along our bee lines network which we'll hear a bit more about uh, later in this session and we're funded by the national lottery heritage fund and seven trent uh, and also telford and regan council as well as some other funders and we're mainly restoring species rich grassland and open mosaic habitat on post-industrial sites Uh, we've got this great webinar tonight, but we have another one coming up uh, next month uh, on th oh, my eyesight is bad. Thursday, the 18th of April uh, with Peter Carty, former National Trust Countryside Manager in South Shropshire, but now chair of the Marches Meadow Group. And he'll be giving us a talk about the life cycle of meadow. So for any, any meadow managers out there, or meadow enthusiasts, that will be a really good talk. So without much further ado, I'm going to get stuck in to the webinar this evening um, and we're going to start with Aaron. So Aaron is a PhD student with the University of Birmingham. He's working with Natural England's Purple Horizons project, which is another habitat connectivity project that's looking to join up uh, relic heathland sites uh, by creating new heathy habitats through the Midlands. His PhD is on habitat fragmentation of, uh, no, the impact of habitat fragmentation of invertebrates on heathlands. And he's going to be talking to us today about the value of lowland heath, particularly for bees and wasps. So it promises to be really interesting. So Aaron, if you're ready, I'll pass over to you. Yeah, thank you, Kay. Um, can everyone see my screen OK? Yeah, brilliant. Um, so, yeah, I am uh, Aaron. I'm a PhD student at the University of Birmingham in the uh, School of Geography, Earth and Environmental Science. Um, and I've been doing my PhD for, for about three years now. It's absolutely whizzed by. Um, but I've been studying bees and wasps in urban areas for about six or seven years. And I kind of got really interested in them um, just after out of university. Um, and it's kind of just gone uh, my passion has just deepened uh, the more I've, I've learned about them and I'm really fortunate to be doing research looking at uh, bees and wasps in a really interesting landscape that we have uh, in Britain called Lowland Heath um, and remarkably we have a lot of Lowland Heath um, in, in my hometown in Birmingham um, and the, the surrounding black country um, which is quite interesting because it's a very urban area Um so I, today I'll, I, my presentation is kind of split into two parts really. The first is to talk a little bit about the value of lowland heath for insects, particularly bees, wasps and hoverflies, um, but also to talk a little bit about how we've been using and pioneering different types of technologies to actually try to improve and restore these sites uh, for these important and, and valuable insect species. So this is <clears throat> this map here is Birmingham the Black Country and all the um, purple splotches actually represent areas um, of uh, lowland heath uh, that actually still remain in the area today. And in fact, if you get on a train at Birmingham Snow Hill Station and you head away from the city centre, you'll go past many different stations with, with names with reference to Heathland. So there's a place like Cradley Heath or Kings Heath. Um, and some of you, uh, anyone who's watched um, Peaky Blinders may know of, of Small Heath. Um, and even West Bromwich, which is quite a famous uh, town in, in the Black Country in Sandwell, is actually that the Bromwich literally translates to the little village on the Heath of Broome. So the entire area, Birmingham, the Black Country, Staffordshire and Worcestershire and parts of Shropshire would have grown up over a very heathy landscape. Um, and these some of these sites have still remained today. Um, in fact, a significant proportion of the city of Birmingham would have grown up over this very, very interesting and ancient landscape. But what actually is Heathland and why is it important? So Heathland is a landscape dominated by dwarf shrubs and uh, they're acidic loving plant species and they're capable of growing in dry, arid conditions. So they're quite sort of uh, desert like species, if you like. Um, and in contrast to upland heath, lowland heath is found below 300 metres sea level and it tends to be a little bit more diverse in terms of its wildlife um, than upland habitats. And the main species you find on heathlands are what we call ericaceous species. And this just literally means heathers. Um, and that's what gives these landscapes their names. Um, but you also have other types of plants like gorse and broom um, that also characterise uh, these landscapes. And they tend to be quite alien looking, quite um, sandy and, and desert-like. Desert um, and they're actually more threatened than tropical rainforest. It's quite a, a, an amazing thing that we have. Britain has 25% um, of the world's heathland. Um, and this habitat is, is more threatened than tropical rainforest. And it, it's found in pockets all over Britain. 
Um, but where where is most of the heathland found? Well, most of it's found on a sandy geology um, in um, it, soils that 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 dwarf shrubs like heather and gorse uh, require to, to actually live in. So heathlands will therefore only be found in areas where the soils are the right quality and the makeup for these dwarf shrubs to take hold. And in Britain, pretty much all of our lowland heath, most of it anyway, well, most of it that's intact, is found in the south of England. But we do have a significant proportion of um, this habitat in the West Midlands. So there's a large proportion in Staffordshire, in Worcestershire as well, and there's there's large pockets in uh, Shropshire too. Um, and the, the geology um, that, that makes up Heathland in our in the West Midlands is uh, what we call Permian and Triassic sandstone. Um, and the greatest concentration of this is on the border between um, Staffordshire and Worcestershire, but there's also pockets in Birmingham as well. Um, and the Black Country actually has about 500 acres acres of lowland heath still remaining in this habitat. Um, and this is a cross section of a site of a, of a heathland um, site in in uh, Birmingham, North Birmingham. And you can see all the way down, it's all sand. And it's a fantastic place for bees and wasps to nest because most bees and wasps in England like to actually nest in sandy substrates. And much of this landscape of Heatham was extracted through mining uh, over the past few centuries. So sites in Warsaw um, and Birmingham had much of the sands and gravels extracted from them. And this was used in the Industrial Revolution to create the infrastructure of, of uh, these areas. And that's actually why uh, this, these areas are called the Black Country. Um, it's because there was such heavy industrial pollution um, in over the past century that the, the smog and the smoke actually stained many of the uh, the buildings black um, and, and gave it uh, this name. Um, a few of these sites um, have been lost to urbanisation, they've been built on, but many of them have actually clung on and we call these our sort of like relic heathlands that we have in this area. And many of uh, some, some of these have been turned into local nature reserves, others have become triple SIs. Um, and what I've been doing over the past three years is studying 25 of these sites scattered across the region um, and looking at um, the quality of the sites, but also looking at the species found within them. So we were trying to find flower visiting insects at these sites like bees, wasps and hoverflies. Um, many bees and wasps in Britain, they're solitary and they like to nest underground. They're what we call um, samophiles, so they're like sand. Um, and we have 250 species of, of wasp in Britain, about 270 species of bee and 240 species of hoverfly. And a good proportion of these are found on heathland sites, uh, particularly for the, the bees and wasps. Um, and what we did is we looked at sites. So this is a, a, an area, the this, this sort of study area. We looked at sites in an urban setting or what we call a peri-urban setting where there's lots of dense um, housing development uh, around these sites. And we also looked at sites in the more sort of suburban fringes of these areas. And then we also compared these to rural sites, which are much larger, much grander and in much better condition. Um, and how did we do it? Well, we actually uh, used two methods. So we used sweep netting, which is when you actually go around with a big sort of butterfly net, if you like, and you catch insects mid-flight. It's very, very chaotic, really fun. Um, and uh, you, you take the specimens away and you identify them in a lab with a microscope. Um, and we also put out pan traps, which also collect um, insect specimens. And, and that helped us to, ident uh, to understand the, the species which are found at each site. And we also looked at the same proportion of each site in our study. So because we had varying sizes we wanted to look at 70 percent of the site for each one um, and we also used a drone to map the habitats but i'll talk a little bit about that later so this is just uh to show you um the the surveying techniques you literally walk along the sand and you collect the bees and wasps into the net um, as you go and it's really surprising how many you get popping out the ground um in these areas so what did we find? Well, we actually found 236 species of bee, wasp and hoverfly across the, across 27 sites in the region. We found that eight sites in the region actually support 180 species of bee and wasp alone. And that represents almost half of the total fauna of Great Britain. And it really underscores the value of these sites um, nationally for, uh, for these species. And we also found that sites that were within the Staffordshire and, and Worcestershire, um, so on the, uh, the more of the rural fringe of the gradient um, of the sample, they tended to have insects of, of greater conservation value and that were a little bit more interesting. So site size, age, management practices, geology and surrounding land use were really important in determining the quality of the site for pollinators. And this is quite um, intuitive if you think about it. The larger the site, the more connected it is, the more access to different types of habitats and diversity that you'll find there. The older a site is, the longer that um, 
the longer time has gone on and has allowed for more complex invertebrate assemblages to form and the interrelationships between these. Management practices are really important. It doesn't matter whether you've, you could have a really big old site, but if it's managed poorly, it will have a, a it will have a less species richness than a, a brand new site that's managed really well. Geology is really fascinating, uh, as we've already touched on, because bees and wasps they like to nest in in a certain type of geology. It's usually sandstone, and that sandstone is in isolated areas throughout the country. So it's where you get. Uh, I say patch the sandstone you'll find really interesting sites and in those sites you'll find really interesting species and quite obviously surrounding land use will be important because sites that are more sort of fragmented and hemmed in by urbanization they will be um they'll have much harder time uh, attracting and supporting insects than the more connected sites so looking at the peri-urban sites you can see that they're a little bit more hemmed in they're more fragmented they're surrounded by housing and at these sites we found what i'd call generalist species um, and these are species that you'd probably find in your garden. Um, so these are things like mining bees, like Andrina cineraria on the left here, the ashy mining bee, or uh, Osmia bicornis, which is um, the red mason bee, which people often get in their gardens and their beer hotels. Then you also got some interesting species of wasp. Um, often most people um, overlook wasps or they, or they kind of hate wasps, but they're incredible insects. Um, we have 240 or 50 species in, in Britain and um, most of them are solitary and they many of them live in woods. They catch flies and they hunt spiders and they're really important for the ecosystem. Um, but in these sort of really urban sites that we looked at, you tend to get a, a poor pool of these species when, where they're found. We also got some interesting hoverflies, like the woodland uh, hoverfly, the Batman hoverfly, Myothropa fleuria. And it's called this because it's literally got like a bat symbol on its thorax. But generally, in the urban sites, it is what we expected to find. It was it was quite species poor. In the suburban sites, things started to change and become a little bit more interesting. And you can see already that these sites look a little bit more wild and they're kind of on the fringes of um, of the West Midlands Combined Authority. And at these sites, what we came across um, were species that were specialists. They tended to be a little bit more scarce um, and they had had a specialism of sorts. And this specialism might have been that they were bees that uh, could only feed from a certain type of flower, such as this species here, Coletis succinctus, which is the, the heather Coletes. So it's what we call it's oligolectic or monolectic on heather. Um, and when you often, often with bees, you get the bees, but you also get their kleptoparasites, their cuckoos. And what we were finding is that as we moved into the suburban sites, we were finding the specialists, but we were also finding the cuckoo species that would attack the specialists. So the, like the Epiolus uh, crucigen bee here, which is a really weird looking bee. And when I tell often children, when I say this is a bee, actually adults as well, when I say that this is a bee, they, they're very confused because it doesn't look anything like a bee, but a quarter of all bees in Britain are cuckoos and they look a lot like this, really cool looking creatures. But we also found some other really amazing insects, um, ones that we weren't recording, but we just stumbled across, like the twin aloe deer fly, uh, Chrysops relictus. Um, and this species is one that was very, very common in the suburban sites, but you would not find it at all in the urban ones. And it really represented a difference in, in the, the quality of the sites. So as we moved into the more rural sites, what we found was that the, the landscape became much more wild, much more connected. Um, and the, the species that you found there were far, uh, first of all, you, we were finding things in far greater abundance and greater diversity, but the things we were finding were much rarer, and that was really key uh, to this research. So we were finding um, everything that you would find in the urban and the suburban sites, but we'd also find species um, that were on the move, new arrivals, and this is a really interesting um, sort of discovery. It links really nicely into connectivity because many of the species that we were finding in the rural sites were using the heathlands as stepping stones. And um, these were often specialist species themselves, and they were very localised, confined to, to certain parts of the country. But where there was appropriate habitat for them to move through, they would utilise it. So we had the um, species like uh, the, the European bee wolf, Philanthus triangulum. It's actually a, it's a wasp that hunts honeybees. It will catch them midair sting them and take them back to its nest. It's a really amazing wasp. Um, and then we also found some really specialist species like the pantaloon bee, uh, Dasyboda hertipes, where you'll only find these species in, in very sandy, very um, nice heathlands, old, well-established heathlands. 
But we also found species like this. So this is Hedicrum nobile, or the noble jewel wasp. And this was a species that was new to Britain in 1998, and it's moved all the way from Kent, or, or Essex and Kent, all the way up into to Staffordshire over a 20-year period. It's moved at a rate of about 10 kilometres a year because of climate change, and it's used heathlands mainly and sand dune systems to do this, to, to, um, to move through the landscape. And it really emphasised the discovery of this species in the West Midlands really emphasised the value of the lowland heaths in these areas for supporting these species as stepping stones. Um, and this map here just shows the distribution. So the yellow marks here are the where this species was found in the West Midlands. And you can see that it's moved northwards really, really rapidly in a really short space of time. Um, so the blue, this uh, image here with the, the wasp with the blue th thorax is the male. And this image here with the wasp with the red thorax is the female. And these are what we call jewel wasps. They're absolutely stunning. We get lots of them in Britain, about 30 or so species. And they're, many of them are kleptoparasites or cuckoos. Um, and in this story, so uh, the female attacks this digger wasp here, the larvae of this digger wasp here. And this digger wasp eats these weevils here. So you have a nice little story where it's kind of like one thing attacks another and another attacks another. It's just how things are in the world of insects. Something is trying to eat or kill something else. Um, but we found this, this nice little life history happening in the West Midlands. But just returning to the sur suburban sites for a second, one of the things that we sort of glossed over um, purposefully was that we found and discovered a really interesting metapopulation of a bee called Andrina tarsata, or the tormental mining bee. And it really emphasised again the value of the suburban sites because this species wasn't found in the rural sites. It was just very, very fortunate that we have it in our area um, in, in, in one of the suburban sites in Walsall in the West Midlands. And it's really interesting this bee because it will only feed from Tormental, Potentilla erecta. Um, that, that's the pollen that it collects, so it's a very niche species. It's also the only bee in Britain to have a tridentate mandible, so it has really goofy teeth if you like. It has three uh, dents on its mandible. And this is actually an internationally threatened bee, um, really, really threatened in continental Europe, um, but it's nationally threatened in Britain. It's a priority species. And because of the discovery of this bee, um, we teamed up with Natural England to apply for some funding to see if we could try to elevate some of the suburban sites to the quality of the rural sites. Um, so we did this through the Purple Horizons project, which is a, a landscape connectivity project that works in the West Midlands. And it was a uh, multi, um, had lots of different organisations involved. And, and basically what, we, what we've done is we uh, secured £25,000 to do habitat restoration work for this bee in looking at eight sites in our area. And we wanted to do this in a way that was um, the, the sort of pioneering and experimenting with new technologies and new techniques. So we used um, UAV or drones to map the habitats um, and drones are fantastic because they're, they're cheap. Well, they're not <laughs> they're not cheap. They are cheaper than hiring an aeroplane and a photographer and flying over a landscape. And they're relatively easy to use. You know, people can, you can fly them from your phone um, and they give fantastic images of the landscape. But even better than that, they can actually quantify the landscape for you. So you can take photographs of the landscape and you can draw around uh, areas of woodland and heather and you can actually measure just how much of a habitat there is and you can monitor how a habitat changes over time. So that's what we did uh, with some of our study sites. So this is Chase Water Country Park in South Staffordshire. So we drew an area over the site which we wanted to fly. The blue dots represent where photographs were taken by the drone um, and in this uh, area it was 485 photographs that were taken and it produces an image a little bit like this. And then what we do is we use something called a GIS or a geographical information software to draw around the areas of heather, which is in pink, woodland, which is in uh, red, and bare earth, which is in yellow. And as you can see, for this site, which is one of the better sites in our sample, there's a tiny amount of sand, there's a tiny amount of bare earth available to bees and wasps. So we wanted to improve that. So we planned to increase the bare earth at this site quite substantially. There's the little pink patches down here at the bottom. Um, and by doing this, we hope that we could attract more bees and wasps and, and the site would be able to support more of these species and it would particularly help the tormental mining bee. So we used the money to, to hire diggers. It was extremely expensive and a very strange thing to do to get diggers into these sites and just scrape away at vegetation. But as you can see here, we will try to expose the sandstone. Um, and what we're going to do is this year, we're going to uh, sample these sites again to see if we've had an effect on the pollinators. We have the baseline data from before the sites were surveyed, then we've carried out some management work and then we're going to see what the sites are like afterwards.
And we didn't just do this at one site. We went a bit wild and we did it at eight sites in Warsaw. We created four acres of habitat in the borough. Um, and you, as you can see, we really unearthed the sandstone. We had to dig down two or three metres, bring the sand up to the top, dig the topsoil underneath and, and level it all out. Um, and it was really quite interesting to see how just un underneath the surface of the soil is this rich sand that's perfect for bees and wasps to nest in. And though it's fantastic that we did all this work, it's nowhere near as cost effective or as just generally effective as a management technique as having grazing animals. It cost us about £3,000 to have diggers uh, on per site and most of the costs came from transporting the, the diggers to and from the site, whereas animals will just do this for free. They will just go around and they'll do it in a much more gradual way and they'll kick up the sand and kick up the dirt. So what we're trying to do in the long term is think about ways of introducing grazing animals to these sites to improve their quality. And one of the other things we're trying to do is because Andrew Natasata is a specialist on tormental, we tried to we went out, we mapped all the tormental in the area, we collected seeds, which was painstaking and arduous, and uh, we took them back to the University of Birmingham, where we've been growing these seeds up uh, as plugs, um, and we also scattered some of the seeds out on the sites um, to try to enhance the distribution of this wildflower on site. And we think and we hope that this will improve not just the the forage that's available to the pollinators, but also the nesting substrate that's available to them as well and it will hopefully um, improve the quality of, of the, the area generally for pollinators um, in Birmingham Black Country. Um, so thank you all for listening, I think that is me done. That was great Aaron, thank you. Um, I thought it might be worthwhile having a, uh, we were going to leave the question session to the end, but I thought while people's minds are fresh, we could have a quick question now. So if anybody does have yeah. any questions for Aaron, uh, pop them in the Q&A. Um, I did have a couple of questions. <laughs> well, yeah, go for it. If, so to give a bit of time, if anybody does want to ask a question in the audience, pop it in the Q&A or raise your hand and we'll get round to you. Um, I just wanted to say that was a great talk and, and just really fascinating. And uh, I had the pleasure of actually going around a few sites with you last year as part of a, a group of people looking at Heathlands. And um, just really interesting to hear how relatively small interventions like those scrapes on big sites have quite an impact and I remember you saying that your studies your surveys had shown the impact that those have could you tell us a little bit more about yeah that, that, so, so it's quite it's quite crazy really to think that I think the 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 main the main point is that bare earth habitat is really scarce in a landscape where where it's found you'll often get um what we call aggregated nesting which is where lots of bees or, or wasps will nest in the same area and part of the reason for that is just because of scarcity so when you have a site that doesn't really have a lot of bare earth and then you very suddenly create a, a, a relatively small patch of a very good habitat in the ideal location it gets colonised very, very quickly, especially if it's a, it's a, a, a big site and it's a, a well protected one. And um, what we were finding just during our research was that um, the scrapes were, the scrapes get colonised very, very quickly. But it's not just that um, bees and wasps nest in it; it's that the disturbance that's caused by the scrapes um, sort of create causes the seed bank to move around, and that leads to heather and gorse and other wildflowers popping up, which in turn attracts pollinators. So. Yeah, it's 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 very simple. Small scale interventions can have a really significant impact on a site if they're done in a, in a targeted and, and thoughtful way. Mm. We actually heard an interesting talk from Shropshire Wildlife Trust and they'd been doing some natural flood management work on a sandy site. And whilst they were there, they put in a couple of scrapes because they thought, well, yeah. why not? It's the ideal substrate. And it was colonised that, af that yeah. afternoon. Things started oh, really? <laughs> using it, like immediately yeah. started coming into the area. So, yeah, it was quite incredible that, that stuff can That's come about yeah. that much. I was also interested in, because me and Emily in our project are working on urban sites and and yeah. you said interestingly there that they tended to be more species poor then you moved into suburban then you moved into the rural areas where the more rarer species come in from in terms of our urban heathland sites from your study have you had any thoughts on what are the best management techniques for really making those sites as attractive as possible for for different types of invertebrate even though they're quite isolated yeah, the, so the thing is, the the urban sites they they're kind of more peri urban. They they they're on the fringes. They they're not quite mm. like sort of really really centralised. So there's kind of hope <laughs> if that makes sense because they 
that there is a lot of adjoining green space around them, if not directly touching them, that you know it's, it's within proximity. Um, the the key thing that we found in the um, so I imagine you guys might have actually found a similar thing is that they though they may not have like huge canyons of bare earth and things like that attract, that attract species they tend to be quite floristically rich because mm -hmm. you have things like garden escapees um or you know you just you have a, an interesting um wildflower uh wildflower assemblages that, that form there so one of the things that we've done there is because we have to think about space and we have to think about you know we can't get many diggers in and it's just not really cost effective to do that and um, that the best thing to do though is to focus on foraging um uh, resources but also to use things like um cavity nesting habitats so bee boxes um anything like that that can just sort of improve the the supporting capacity of a small space can be really useful but yeah it's it i think one of the things i, I will say is i'm with my research with heathlands the peri-urban sites do tend to be more species poor but that's just with heathlands i think if you were to look at maybe grasslands and, and other if, other different types it might it may not actually be like that at all my uh experience is this isn't so much with research but just going around catching insects um is that actually urban sites can be really really species mm. rich if not for bees but for other other groups as well so it's yeah it, it, it is a bit difficult to, to say for certain yeah to be very unscientific i have i did read a paper and i can't remember who it was by or what it was called but uh uh it was about how um some urban sites do boast a, a richer species assemblage yeah. just because of the variety of habitats that are available there like gardens and there's yeah. there's often lots of like little micro habitats in quite small areas you know the one yeah. garden might have a pond another's got a, a leaf litter yeah. pile another's got a compost heap so yeah they can be very but important there's actually a really interesting that we have a book uh, called the uh, the flora of Birmingham in the Black Country, and in, there's a really interesting fact in there that at 47 percent of all species of wildflower found in Britain are found in Birmingham in the Black Country. So almost half of yeah. Britain's wildflower fauna is found in tiny urbanised area, and it's because of the disturbance, because of the urbanisation, it, it's created all these micro habitats. So yeah, people often look down on urban areas, but I I, have, I think they can be really fantastic places to find wildlife. We have had a question come in, Aaron. Well, we've had a, a couple of people saying thank you for the talk. Um, Rachel Morton has asked, how much investigation study do you have to do in preparation in case improvement for one species inadvertently stuffs it up for another species? <laughs> It's a really good question, actually. Um, often, often it's a long tax as well. You know, you you you're very narrow. Your field of vision is very narrow. You're looking at bees. You're looking at wasps. You're looking at things for a very particular group. Um, what we do at the minute is could be it's it's actually a because we don't have many taxonomists or many people to help with the research we rely on volunteers to come out and, and do the monitoring so whilst i'm monitoring the bees and wasps we do have another student looking at a uh, beetle ground nesting beetles and often the two don't align actually so what works for bees and wasps may not work for beetles um so we have other groups that monitor um how how this impacts other, other wildlife but generally the issue that most research has and often with invertebrates it's, it's particularly bad is that we don't have a lot of baseline data to go off mm. um, and that's why long-term recording efforts are really important so this project is in, it's in, in its infancy really even though it's in like two years old it's, it's very very young um, this is the start of our recording to understand how uh, this affects different groups and as we sort of go further down the rabbit hole we'll we'll expand that out yeah yeah um well uh, great talk. I also particularly enjoyed the footage of the cow, uh, the longhorned, uh, English longhorn cow, uh, creating a bit of scrape work there itself. I just think it's lovely yeah, to see fine. that because often when you get these mechanical means in, they look unnatural and like, well, these features wouldn't be there. But to, you know, get that video of a large herbivore yeah. causing that disturbance is, is really great. Yeah. Um, I, I was wondering, actually, oh, sorry. sorry. Um, Aaron, with the yeah. um, the sand scrapes that you did, have you had much or will you have much regrowth of different plants coming through on, on there? Yeah, yeah we, will. we, we absolutely got, will. We've um, put in a few scrapes and I'm just worried about what's going to come back up. Um, yeah, me too, me too. Um, this is that this is actually interesting. We had a meeting with the Natural England the other day and, and one of the things I said in these is that we were saying how fantastic it was that we've made these scrapes and 
no, I, I had to point out at the end of this season, they will mostly be vegetated unless we mm. get people to manage them or we stick animals on them to do it. So it's a constant battle, yeah. isn't it? You're trying to... Yeah, ongoing yeah, management all the time. Ongoing management, yeah. 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 Well, great talk as well. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Right. You're, you're up, Indy. So Indiana Jones, she's a PhD student uh, with the University of Liverpool. And... It's exciting to hear from Indy tonight because she's essentially testing the Beelines hypothesis. So uh, Bug Life's Beelines network um, that we've been working towards and what mine and Emily's project is based on, uh, following this kind of predefined network where we're trying to restore habitats um, on a linked up network that is linking up our best remaining wildflower patches. So we're testing whether that hypothesis does actually work um, for pollinators. That's what Indy's looking into. So. Um, She's also been doing her delivery work with our uh, her field work with our delivery partner on the project, Herefordshire Meadows, who are a brilliant charity uh, working in Herefordshire, restoring species rich grassland across the county. And they were able to work with Indy and offer uh, a series of, of relatively connected sites for Indy to carry out her field work. So Indy's here to talk about her PhD research. Her PhD is the success, it's a tongue twister, the, su yeah. the success of strategic restoration for pollinator connectivity so over to you indy thank you very much awesome yeah uh i will preface this by saying unfortunately i do not have any exciting drone footage to share you uh that was not in our budget but yeah that's me so this is uh just a bit of an overview of my field work from last year and then talking about what the next steps are so I'm not quite as far in as Aaron is, so I'm a year and a half roughly in, which seems to have gone very quickly. And my project is based at the University of Liverpool, um, but it's in partnership with the University of York and Bug Life as well. And yeah, as Kate said, I did work in Herefordshire over the summer. So this is just a bit of background information really um, about why we've chosen to focus on this kind of area of research. So I should say as well, the landscapes that I've been looking at are not heathland. So mine has been grassland, so meadow sites. So they will be a bit different. So I'll have different species and things that I'll see. And it's just a bit of a different habitat to look at really. But the main reason that we're interested is thinking about climate change. So we all know that temperatures are changing and that means that different species are going to have to move location because they're going to be out of their range of tolerance. And it can also mean that other species will come in that we haven't had before and things like that. And some species we might just lose altogether. Um, speaking of, <laughs> we are in a state of pollinated decline, unfortunately. So we've got 33% according to a paper, but the numbers are pretty consistent um, of wild pollinators declining between 1980 and 2013. It's probably going to keep going, I would assume, but we're going to hope that we can mitigate that. And uh, the other reason that we're interested in beeline specifically is because the landscape for policy is really changing at the moment. So part of it is because of uh, Brexit, which I know is taboo to talk about, but we've changed a lot of our environmental policies because of leaving the European Union. So there's a lot of things that used to be in play, like um, ELMs, which is like environment land management schemes and things like that, that are different now that we're not in the EU. So those were things that would incentivize farmers particularly, but like landowners in general to make improvements for wildlife. Um, now we've got different policies. So one example is a thing that you may or may not have heard of, depending on what circles you're in, which is called BNG, which is biodiversity net gain. And that has recently come into effect. So that's basically saying that if you develop on a piece of land, you have to increase the biodiversity of it by, I think it's 10 percent, but it probably depends on the land. But it's going to be interesting to see how people are going to put that forward. So beelines could be one way that people can improve their kind of environmental footprint, if you will. 
So yeah, what are the bee lines? So we've just had a bit of an introduction to them, but this is the bee lines map. So there's an interactive one on the Bug Life website, as I'm sure some of you know. So you can have a look and see if where you live is on a bee line. And if it is, I would encourage you to try <laughs> plant some wildflower seeds in your garden or at your place of work or whatever you do. But the idea is that it will create a connected highway of wildflower rich habitat. Um, yeah, so it's at least 150,000 hectares is what we would like to restore, which would be the dream. Um, and the locations for these were chosen based off of pre-existing habitat maps of wildflower in the UK. So it's kind of uh, running under the assumption of where we would get the most bang for our buck, essentially, where would be the easiest and the best places to allocate resources. Because unfortunately, in the world of conservation, there's never enough money to do as much as you want to. So it's good to kind of prioritise where you want to put your efforts. So that's kind of the idea. These are the aims of my PhD project overall. So the ones with the stars on are the things that I'm currently working on. So I'm looking at which species in particular have colonised the restored habitat that I'm looking at, what impact that connectivity has had on pollinator colonization success, which again is a tongue twister that you don't want to say three times fast. Um, and then future work is going to look at how restoration within bee lines compares to restoration outside of bee lines in terms of um, benefits to pollinators and also in terms of um, ease and benefit to landowners as well. And then we would like to develop a framework for planning similar projects in the future. So there are a few projects knocking about that are kind of along the same vein in terms of connectivity based because it is quite a hot topic, I suppose. So there's like the Treescapes project off the top of my head. And I think there's one specific near me, which is trying to, it's another tree based one of like trying to join up a big woodland. But there's not loads to my knowledge of um, more grasslandy based ones. So I went out on field work and that was last summer. And normally I would say, look at all these nice pictures of me on field work, but I am <laughs> camera shy. So my favourite photo was this one of this lovely cat that we met on one of the farms. This is my glorious map, which shows where I went on field work. So I was in Herefordshire, as we've said, with Herefordshire Meadows. Um, we got, well, so we were trying to limit the amount of variables because we have a kind of saying in ecology research that it's always dirty science in that you can't um, account for everything. So you have to try and limit the variables as best as you can. So we wanted to get sites that were all restored in the same year. So they're all at the same kind of stage of restoration success. So we've got, we had 23 sites in total that we went to. Five of those sites were considered control sites. So they were on the same like wider site. So the most of them were farmland, but a couple of them were small holdings. So they were in the same kind of geographic location. So you didn't have to account for variances in terms of like temperature and weather and things. But uh, they were unrestored. So they didn't have any work gone into them. And they were mostly semi-improved grassland, I would say. And then we had 18 restored sites. So most of them, I think, were restored using seed mixes. So those are commercial wildflower seeds that will have definitely yellow rattle in. If you ever listen to anyone talking about meadow restoration, they'll talk to you about yellow rattle, which is um, a plant that alters the soil around it and it makes it easier for other species to grow is the short explanation. <laughs> and then a few of them had green hay cutting and a couple just had yellow rattle seeds added to them. And we got like a good spread, a good spread in terms of 
we got like all areas of the county apart from the middle but that's because the middle's more built up so these are the kind of sites that we had this is just a quick overview so we did have some that were grazed more frequently than others so we recorded that um so that we know for when we start to do the statistical analysis but we made sure that we had some grazed control sites and some non-grazed control sites so that we can still compare against the two but most sites looked like this one on the left which kind of has tall blades of grass and then lots of different species of wildflower within them and you can't see because she is also camera shy but in the photo on the right that's actually my field assistant sally she's in the background you can't see but that's probably the best photo <laughs> that we got um so she came out with me so there was just two of us so not loads of manpower but i think we did pretty well considering so what did we actually do whilst we were there um we did three well two and a half things realistically so we did pan trapping botanical surveys and bee and hoverfly walks um whilst we were there so this is just an example of our pan trap setup so the one on the left is to basically demonstrate that we put the pan traps out at the same height of vegetation so that's essentially to trick the insects into thinking that those are flowers for them to fall into so before i went out on my field work i read a lot of papers about different colors of pan traps and the pros and cons of each but essentially the kind of standard advice is to do them in sets of threes and you have one white one blue and one yellow so that's what we did and we did see a shift um over the course of the season so we went out in two blocks i think the first block from memory was early may and then the second block was late june early july um and they did shift like the abundance in each color basically did shift over the season so it makes sense because if you see that field there there's majority yellow flowers out and there's some white ones so at the beginning we didn't get many in the blue pots because there weren't that many blue flowers out but then towards the end of the season we got more in those ones so we set them out in sets of 10 um we just had to pick a number basically and we put them 10 meters apart in two parallel rows so the kind of standard advice is not to put them any closer than six meters apart and because we had a lot of sites of varying size we basically figured out the largest volume we could put in the smallest site and then we surveyed the same kind of area of land at each of the following sites so it was kind of standardized we put them in two parallel rows one towards a boundary and one towards the middle of the site that was basically it's a bit of a dry explanation but there are a lot of different variations in how you can put pan traps out and we decided that that would be the best because you get the most accurate spread that we could see um and also the benefit of putting one along a boundary is that it can kind of take into account edge effect um we try to avoid putting them along a water boundary just because that can often change this kind of species that you would find so because we are trying to look at grass and species rather than kind of riverside species for example that's why we did those uh we left pretty much all of them out for 24 hours and then we collected them in so the only times that we pulled them early is if the last hour or so it was raining and we didn't want them to overflow because you you put water in the bottom of them with a bit of um washing up liquid essentially to catch them in and we didn't put them out in every any heavy wind or rain because there wouldn't be anything flying that picture on the left is the only picture of me i have from field work so we've got another tiny far away person picture <laughs> but that's me doing one of my botanical surveys 
And then, yeah, on the right is just an example of some of the kind of species we were finding. It's a terrible photo there, so <laughs> apologies. So for the botanical surveys, we did uh, random quadrats. So we get one by one meter squares, essentially, and we counted, uh, well, that's not true. We, we did the one by one meter squares. We did them completely randomly. And for each site, we did about six. And for each quadrat, we recorded which species were present um, for all of the plants. And then we recorded the proportion of cover within that quadrat. Um, I will probably explain why in a bit, but the short answer is because my background is in botany and I was always taught to do a thing called MVCs, which I'll talk about later. Um, but that's why I did it that way. The only exception on the species level was if the sword, so like the blade of grass, if it was too small, so there was no ligule, which is if you have a blade of grass and then you pull it back, there's a little like semi-translucent flap. And that's how you identify a lot of grasses if they don't have a seed head. If they were below that point, we would just assign it as miscellaneous grass. Um, and the Herefordshire Meadows logo is down there because they also did quadrats at the same site. So we could use some of that um, data to just check against ours and just to make it a bit of a more robust data set. Uh, this is the half that I was talking about. So we also did bee and hoverfly walks. We were intending on doing the same as Aaron in terms of sweet netting, but I don't know if it's mine and Sally's technique or if it was just the bees that we were uh, looking at, but they did not want to go in our nets whatsoever. So what we actually ended up doing was we had these pots that we were collecting the pan traps in with anyway. We had some left over. So we would get our pots and we would just um, sneak up on the bees and the hoverflies and then catch them, which was a bit of a learning curve, but I'm very good at that now. So if anyone ever needs a bee catching, um, I'm your guy. Um, we set timers for 30 minutes each. We would pause them when we were catching an individual so that we could use the full time. And we did random walking again but within that same area that i said before so that all of the sites were the same and we recorded all the species that we could if we didn't know what it was then we would take it home which always made me sad i don't know why there's something about setting out a pan trap and then coming back and like the job of killing things is done for you it's a bit removed but when you're actually catching something and then putting a killing fluid in it feels very mean um, but the reason why I say half is because you, we had very strict, um, conditions that needed to be met for us to do this. So we said it had to be above 15 degrees if it was a cloudy day or 13 degrees if it was less than 50% cloudy and it couldn't be more than slightly windy. There is a, um, <laughs> there is a, a word for it but I always forget it but there's there is a scale of windiness and it's basically if it is less than moving um, a twig on a tree and yeah we there were only two of us doing all of these sites and yeah just a combination of the time and we did get hit with some pretty bad uh, thunderstorms just meant that we couldn't do as many as we wanted to so I got back from my fieldwork and then it was data analysis time. So I start, yes, thank you, John. Booth what scale, very true. Um, so we started with the pan trap pots. So we collected them all in. Uh, we separated them out by um, transect row and site and color of pan trap. And potentially contentiously we sorted them into the following groups so we had bees hoverflies butterflies and moths beetles and other so i didn't do wasps in mine i haven't separated them out but i've kept all my material so if we decide that we have time i can go back and do wasps at a later date and i went through all of them 
initially I did count everything, but it took way, way, way too long because we had a lot, a lot of flyers. Like I think we had 500 in like about 200 to 500 per pot. And we just decided it's not worth me sitting at home, tweezering out individual flies and counting them. So <laughs> we've recorded the amount of individuals for all of the key groups, though. So we can compare that to the different sides. So this has got a bright yellow star on it because I need to point out that this is not finalized um, data, but this is the graph that I can show you. So the control group is in the pink and then the treatment group is in the blue. Um, so we've got bees and then hoverflies and then butterflies and moths and then beetles. So this is just number of individuals at each site. So we can see that the the kind of mean number of individuals of all of the key groups are higher at the treatment sites, which is very good news. Uh, that's what we like to see. <laughs> the restoration is doing something, which is always good. And then our control sites are lower on the left. So also from this, because there's only me going through the data, um, I. I'm the only person in my lab group that's kind of focusing in on this question. So we had to choose which group we're going to focus on first out of the four. And the B group had the fewest amount of outliers. And it seems to have the most clear difference between the control and the treatment. So we're going to focus on that first and then potentially if I have time or if someone wants to use it in the future, because again, we're keeping all of our samples, then we can go through some of the other groups as well. So the botanical data is an interesting one. So from the graphs, you would think there would be a very clear difference in terms of the botanical data, because we can see that in the insect communities. We have run a lot of different um, analysis on the botanical data and it is not making a whole lot of sense to be completely honest with you. So we've done MVC scores and Ellenberg scores for everything. Um, Ellenberg is basically, it's like listing abiotic factors for different species to show their preferences. And then NVC is a is national vegetation classification, which I always get told to tell people because I forget that it's not common knowledge. But it basically breaks different habitats down into subtypes. So all of the sites that we went to were mesotrophic grassland and they were all between four and seven for anyone that is in the MVC loop. But it basically just means they're all um, hay meadows and the control and the treatments weren't markedly different. We had another look at the proportion of insect pollinated plants at each site and again there was some indication of difference but it wasn't a clear indication however we've got more data now from Herefordshire Meadows of their um, primary surveys that they did so we're hoping that that will explain things because it should show the the difference from when they first um, looked at the site versus when they've restored it this is just a little picture to say, what did I learn from fieldwork? I learned it takes a long time, a lot of effort. And I also learned that I really should invest in a camera because this photo on the right is the only, the only photo I took of bees um, that ended up being in focus <laughs> and clear enough to tell what it is. So next time I know. And also I think, um, I'm going to go out and fill work again, hopefully this year, and focus only on the kind of bee and hoverfly walks, because I think I just, I you kind of assume, because it only takes about an hour for each one, you think, oh, fine, that's going to be really quick. But because the weather is so dependent and you have other things to do, like carry these pan traps around a bunch of sites, it just didn't, it just didn't pan out. So I'm hoping that this summer we can go and fix that. This is just a quick look at what I'm doing currently. So my whole life now is looking down this very old fashioned microscope at different uh, individuals of bee because I'm identifying them all to species. And this is just an example of my favourite bee to get. 
um, because it's the most obvious. So we can see here it's got hairy eyeballs. That's very important. And the um, third picture is the wing veination, which I understand if you've never looked at bee wing veins before, this probably looks like nothing. But to me, this is very distinctive now. Uh, yeah, so it's a honeybee. I just wanted to put this in because um, I stored my individuals in ethanol and I didn't realise how much they look just, for want of a better word, just nasty. Like the other day I was out with my partner and we were on a walk and he was showing me this honeybee that was not looking great. And I didn't even realise it was a honeybee at first because it looked so nice compared to all of the bees that I've been looking at that have been sat in ethanol for so long. So I asked my friend, how do I make this interesting for non-bee people? And he said I should make a quick tier list. So this is my very subjective tier list of which species are the most fun to identify, or well, which groups. So S tier is the best and E tier is the worst. So S tier, we've got our friend the honeybee, because um, there's basically only one species, Apis mellifera. There are subspecies, um, but that's the only one you're going to see and it's very distinctive then the second one that's a longhorned bee which I actually was very excited to see I actually saw one in Herefordshire which was pretty amazing and then that third one there that's a anthophora which is a hairy footed flower bee and that's also very distinctive because it has these very straggly hairs on its legs and it's one of the first ones that comes out my friend in Herefordshire actually found one on his table the other day. Then in A tier, we've got the good old fashioned uh, bumblebee. That's the one that most people are the most familiar with. If you want to start identifying bees, I would definitely say Bombus is a good place to start. They're quite, quite good. Um, then we have scissor bees as that second one, which you might not be as familiar with. But there's only two species of recorded in Britain. So you've got a pretty good chance of getting the right one. <laughs> So I've put that one between A and B. Those are the yellow faced bees. Um, they're relatively easy, I would say, once you get your eye in. It's just that sometimes those yellow markings on their faces can be a bit malformed. So they're not as easy to do. And then that one on B, that's uh, a nomada. Um, that's that kind of group. I would say they're not so bad once you know what you're looking at. It's just that those are the ones that people will mistake for wasps. Um, we actually caught a bunch of wasps that we thought were no matter uh, at first. And then we realised that we had been poking a wasp nest for the first <laughs> half an hour. So that was good. Then that that little icon that I've just put there, that's just to represent the Stellis, which are the dark bees. They're not too bad. But they are a bit fiddly. Um, and then we've got uh, the, I think that's Andrina, a photo of, yeah. So those are the mining bees. Um, they're, again, not so bad once you get your eye in. It's just that there's loads and loads of species. That's our biggest genus in the UK. D there, that's a Sphacoides, which is a blood bee. Basically, any finicky ones are ones where they're very dark and you have to count how many little holes are on them. And then my least favourite group to identify, but uh, they are very nice bees, are the Helictus and Lassioglossum kind of group. So just quickly, these are my next steps. So I'm going to check those old botanical surveys, finish identifying my bees to species and planning my fieldwork. And then... I haven't really had time to talk about it today because it's a bit technical, but I'm going to compare the data that I have so far to connectivity values of the site. So that's basically, even though our sites weren't on B lines, they were of different um, connectivity values with the idea being that B line sites will be very connected and then sites not on B lines will be unconnected. And then just finalise future plans for the next couple of years of work. And these are just some people I would like to thank. So, um, yeah, Jamie and Rachel from Bulk Life for all their help. Herefordshire Meadows, of course, Sally, my field assistant, and then Jenny, Jane and Greg, my supervisors, and then my funding body, NERC. Yeah.
great thanks indy that's um that's really interesting and yeah it's going to be fascinating to see what that pan trap data when those connectivity values are, are put together would you mind um so the connectivity values yeah is are you measuring how connected a site is dependent on if well established sites are near it what what influences those connectivity values yeah so i'm just trying to think of the least like complicated way to explain it so basically we got our shape file so basically you can get maps in GIS that Aaron was talking about. So we had our points for where our sites were going to be. And then we had our um, file of pre-existing wildflower habitat. Mm -hmm. And then we run, a, it's like a rasterizing function on it. Um, it's called the Hansky metric, if anyone wants to look into it. But essentially, you put in dispersal distances for different species, well, for different groups which um, a person called Claudia is working on in my office. She did all the work for that, which is awesome. So you put in that kind of dispersal distance data and then it tells you for each group, so for bees, for example, how easy or difficult it is for them to go from the pre-existing habitat to that new mm. um, habitat patch. And we, we were very lucky in that we did have quite a decent spread of connectivity values. I mean, it's it's never perfect because you can't like just the way ecology is. We were in talks with a different location as well, but we ran the connectivity metrics for them and they were pretty much all the same. So we couldn't use their sites. OK. Yeah, that's interesting. Right. So, yeah, so you have to account for. So. The, the sites it's it's less to do about the sites it's more to do about the dispersal rate of the species yeah in terms of connectivity yeah yeah um they're all the same habitat type and the same restoration age purely because that kind of standardizes it mm -hmm. so you don't have to account that as a covariate yeah the analysis it just makes the modeling simpler essentially um but yeah in terms of connectivity it's predominantly based on dispersal distance mm. yeah well you've got quite obviously quite a lot of work on your hands because there's quite a lot of factors to this phd isn't there in terms of botanical surveys yeah you know bid as well as and and, and the other groups as well you've got your hands full yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's certainly a, a learning curve. <laughs> I was really interested and it's something that I've thought about for a while actually and yeah. when you brought it up I was like oh that's fascinating the colour preferences of the of the pan traps because every year when I'm out about walking it you know I've, I've, I've looked at the through the year it does seem like the white flowers come out first yeah you know your snowdrops your wood anemone um, I suppose I'm thinking more of woodland uh, flowers and then it goes through this wave of yellow mm -hmm. and then towards the end of the summer you get this wave of like purple and blue with like your knapweed and your devil's bit scabious and your harebells and I was like yeah what why is that what is that and it's just interesting that the insects responded to that colour wave as well um, yeah yeah do you know but do you know anything more about that or was that just something that you came up on reading? Is there any reason why those colour blocks seem to go through the year? Oh, I can't say that I know the answer to that. But no, I, I am I'm... also intrigued about it. Yeah. That's, so that's partly why when I was collecting them in, I split them up into um, colours as well. Just, I mean, for ease as well. Um, just in terms of not having an inordinate amount of pots to carry with me on the train. <laughs> but yeah, also because I did think if I get time to, I would like to investigate that a bit as well. But potentially as a kind of hobby side project. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, th I think it's uh, it's really interesting because it's something that I've noticed and thought about and thought, I wonder if there is some kind of, I don't know, reason for this colour succession through the year. Um. We did have a question. I'm just rolling through the chat. Uh, it's from Charles. Um, it might be a question for me and Emily as well. So it's, do you monitor established beeline plots? Uh, he has a five hectare meadow just north of Yorkshire. Um, oh, cool. What I will say on that, it, from a bug life point of view, because we've done a few beelines projects now, 
And unfortunately, due to the funding cycles, often we're, we're funded for a short time, you know, usually as short as a year to, to mainly the most common projects are two to three years. Uh, in that time, we try to get the baseline data, but often we don't have the longevity to keep monitoring those sites. Um, so we have got lots of baseline data for lots of sites and those are stored. And we hope that if we have some funding to return to some of our project sites, that we can go and re-monitor um, some beeline sites. But it's why it's fantastic to have, you know, Indy doing a PhD that's, that's looking at this uh, method and doing some concentrated survey work because we so often don't get to do it in projects because we're kind of pulled at all angles between restoration monitoring and engagement so it, it is a tricky one but it is one that be like, that bug life is thinking of and trying to find ways to revisit project sites so that we can collect some data and repeat the baseline data that we've collected but it all depends on funding but I don't know if you want if you had anything to add to that, India. I just wanted to give the bug life context as to why when we, we find it quite difficult to revisit sites. Yeah, um, yeah. To be honest, we I don't think Liverpool have scope to either. <laughs> it's yeah. the short version. <laughs> um, I think Herefordshire Meadows though are, are having the same kind of problem. So they they do get people. They they have some scope for getting people out to do repeat surveys um, and they are trying to encourage the landowners to do them themselves when they can. Mm. So they have got a template that they give people. But yeah, outside of that, I think that's quite a universal problem, really. Yeah. Herefordshire Meadows have got a really good system because they do put a lot of time and energy into into training up the landowners yeah, don't yeah. They? And, and, and equipping the landowners with the skill to be able to carry out um what they call rapid vegetation assessment so it's picking a few key indicator species and and walking through your meadow and, and having a look but that's very much botanical so yeah. charles if you were interested there's lots of um resources on herefordshire meadows um but also plant life i believe about rapid vegetation assessment so if it's something that you were interested in in carrying out on your own meadow um that's something that you could look into it's it's fairly it's fairly quick and easy i say easy um it does take a bit of getting your eye in and and getting to grips with a few species but there's definitely yeah. lots of guidance out there so if that's of interest do go and have a look um just let us know in the chat if if your site is a site from a previous project um that would be interesting because i think we we are talking about the possibility of being able to go back to previous project sites because it would be lovely to collect data off our previously restored sites. And uh, me and Emily have been doing work in our current project, um, carrying out rapid vegetation assessment. Emily's been carrying out bee walk transects. And um, yes, it would be lovely to to build on that data in years to come because it's often you know, especially with meadows, you're not really seeing them settle until about seven to ten years in of their after their restorations when they start to reach a bit of an equilibrium and uh, really yeah. get into their own character. So unfortunately for us, we, we do very much have to swoop in, do the restoration, get a couple of years data and then leave and, and leave the management and everything, obviously, with the landowners and leave them with management plans and then hopefully be able to come back in a few years time and see how they're doing. Um, but as the case with all this work, it depends on on funding. So yeah. any funders out there? <laughs> I would say just a s s kind of separate point. But um, if you are someone that wants to do um, plant specifically, um, if you want to do plant surveys and you're new to botany, I would say two really good resources for that outside of the ones that have already been mentioned are there's the app iNaturalist. Um, there's a few other apps, but iNaturalist is personally my favourite. Um, it You can take a photo. It's, it works best with multiple photos, but if you take a photo on your phone, essentially it will tell you, this is what I think this is. And then other people on that app will check your photo. So a lot of the time I go on there and just check a bunch of mosses because that's my background. Um, and then the other thing is the Collins guide is my favourite. I forget exactly what it's called, but it's like the guide to British flora or something it's got a black cover anyway and it's Collins one um that's a really good um key if you want to start with keys as well that's the one I've always used yeah thanks for the recommendation thanks we do we've got a question 
Indeed. And it's about the Hatsky metric is really interesting, which I don't I know nothing about. Don't even know what it is. So I'm not so few. Uh, currently trying to plan a master's project to determine connectivity between marsh fertility populations on Bodmin Moor in Cornwall. Mm. Is the software on GIS pretty reliable or do site visits seem to suggest better connectivity elsewhere? OK, that is a big question. I feel like... <laughs> My fault. I feel like I probably didn't explain it well enough. So it's Hansky. So it's H-A-N-S-K-I if you want to look into it. So you make you you have to already have the shape files unless you can make them from scratch, but not that many people can do it. So it's not necessarily a GIS software, so to speak. Um, you put those into GIS. Then you run the Hansky metric through R, at least that's what I've always done. And then R spits out the other raster that then you can put back into GIS. And then you have to do it. This is very complex. I'm very sorry. But then you basically tell, um, <laughs> you put your points on that raster and then you tell it, look at what value that point is based on that raster and that's what gives you the value but if you are very interested in it i can send emily my email and you can always email me about it um marsh fertilities though i think actually my supervisor has done some work on that um so i would suggest if you are interested if i'm allowed to say then you should maybe reach out to jenny hodgson or look at some of her papers because i'm pretty certain she's got some on exactly that just not on in Cornwall and then the other thing to quickly mention sorry uh is you can get QGIS which is um the free version of ArcGIS which is what researchers use QGIS is what the majority of um from my understanding anyway ecological consultants use so there's loads and loads of information about how to use QGIS online there's actually probably more about how to use QGIS than how to use ArcGIS especially because ArcGIS has just changed. So if you did want to start doing it, I would suggest starting with QGIS and then see how you feel. Sorry that, that was helps. long. No, that's all right. <laughs> I hope that helps, Thomas. Um, it, sound, it sounds like there's some stuff out there for you to look into and research, and it sounds like a, a potentially really good master's project. So good luck with that. Um, thanks so much, Indy, for your talk. I We have got one more question, which I feel we have to acknowledge because it's from Tom Price, who's put it in the Q&A, so nice. top marks for putting a question in the Q&A to Tom. It's actually for Aaron, though. I don't know if you're still, are you still here, Aaron? Would you like to answer yeah, this question? It's from Tom. He's, he's asked, how specific is the sandy heathland around Birmingham to the success of these bees? Can any land of a sandy nature become good habitat for bees? Or is the lowland heath in the West Midlands a specific sandy habitat that is difficult to replicate? That's an awesome question. Um, that's kind of, one of the things we were trying to find out is, is exactly that. Um, and I don't have any like solid evidence. It's more just sort of circumstantial. But what we found is that it, it's less so much the sand, it's the geology. So it's this it's the formation of uh, of these. Uh, it's the presence of, of a formation where you've got Permian and Triassic sandstone, where those two geologies meet across the country. You tend to get sand grains, which we think are more circular. So when they when each individual sand grain sits together, they create a more sort of softer substrate for insects to burrow into. Um, but on the point of whether any sand can be used to what uh, can be proliferate for bees and wasps, I think that is the case, but it just needs the amount, the right amount of time to establish. Um, often what actually leads to like nesting aggregations is um, what we call phylopetry, is when you have lots of insects nesting together. And the reason they do that is because they're releasing scent chemicals into the substrate over time. So um, it tends to be when you find wild bees naturally across a landscape, it's in is in pockets where they have a certain geology, but you can turn any area into a sort of a, a good habitat for bees and wasps by improving the quality of the sand. And there's many different ways that you can do that. Great. Thanks, Aaron. Well, I think we're, it's quarter past eight. 
So we've we've run over, but we've had some good questions and two great talks. Thank you so much, Indy and Aaron. Really fascinating. Really enjoyed it. I hope everyone did it as, here as well. I know they did because we've had lots of nice comments saying thank you for the fascinating presentations. And hopefully we sent some people away with some with some research to do and some ideas and uh, yeah. actions to take. Um, please do join us for our next webinar. Oh, Emily might have to remind me. Thursday, the 28th of April. 18th of April. 18th. I knew there was an age <laughs> in there. Thursday, the 18th of April with Peter Carty. Uh, fantastic speaker, Peter is. Uh, lots of years of experience of managing species rich grass. And he's a former countryside manager with the National Trust. And he now chairs the Marches Meadow Group, which is very active here in Shropshire. So it'll be an interesting talk from him on the life cycle of a meadow. But for this evening, hope you all have a lovely rest of your evening. Big thank you to Indy and Aaron. Uh, well done, guys. Thanks.